so we are starting Legacy again tonight, and we're going to continue uh, some of what we talked about last week with um, the whole armor of God. And, you know, we would obviously hope that uh, you'll take this scripture very seriously because it is such an incredible prescription for how to be strong in the Lord. And uh, we read this last week. And was it here? Was it here? For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. <laughs> I feel, I feel attacked. <laughs> I just had to look at you. Mm. That's okay. Um, she talked promise. about you. You can go back and watch the video so, and see if she slandered you too bad. So if you rewind, and I, was, I don't mean to hijack it, but when I was in college, I worked out all the time. And I came home from the gym, and my mom had stuck that verse on the mirror in my bathroom <laughs> when I got home. So, so that's great. So, yeah, that's, subtle. That's uh, Mammy, Mammy subtle. was subtle with that one. Passive aggressive. Yeah. So I'm, I'm well, well aware and familiar with that verse. <laughs> when I said it last yeah. week, I'm off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Noted. Noted. It's of some value, though, David. Keep that in mind. It is of yeah. some value. Very little value. That's fair. <laughs> but some. Um, okay, so the whole armor of God, just kind of real quickly to remind you, the belt of truth, um, so important in a society that does not hold up truth as important. Um, we, we all kind of mean it. And I had a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, it's, uh, Rainbow Maria, said we were talking last week, and she said, I have told my kids, if you ever say, that's my truth. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, another word. The point being, there is a truth, okay? And your your children cannot make up their own truth. It is what it is. Um, and Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. And so you know, our main admonition there is, as parents, of course, we want to purposefully and dutifully and faithfully teach our children the truth, just like David just talked about his mom doing. Uh, in love, though. Teach it in love, Mammy. That's right. Uh, the next one's the breastplate of righteousness, and of course the breastplate is what protects us from the enemy's attacks on our heart, and um, so there's th actually three uh, chapters in Ephesians that are reminding you that uh, of who you are and how you are to act based on uh, that the, our righteousness. Okay, so we're going to remember with our children to exalt righteousness to make sure that our children know what that looks like, what it doesn't look like, um, and there's a million opportunities through the course of the 18 to 24 years that you have them in your presence and around you to to make sure that they understand what it looks like in terms of righteousness. And the most important part of that, of course, is that we can't do it. <laughs> that we have Christ's righteousness and we can stand in his righteousness. There's a really good book that I read this week. It's a little bitty pamphlet like this, but it's called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. And the big thing that he emphasized was Tim Keller. I don't know if y'all ever read Tim Keller's book, but he, he emphasizes that if we can rest in the righteousness of Christ. It just wipes away all insecurity. We're not we're not living based on our own righteousness. We're, based, we're living based on Christ's righteousness. And it just enables us to do the right thing ourselves. Uh, the next one is the gospel of peace. Um, and the gospel of peace is that incredible you know, peace that we have to offer the world, which is the gospel. And, um, and the, you know, emphasizing to our children repeatedly, you know, that and, and making sure that they can quote back to you what the gospel is, the fact that humans are in a predicament, we're all sin, you know, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, that's a huge verse. If they don't understand that, then they're going to get lost along the lines of the Pharisees, okay? They're going to get very lost in that. Um, we're naturally selfish. We're naturally prone to wrongdoing. It takes hard work and faithfulness to God in order to um, to not do anything that's 
not do wrongdoing. And so the key to the gospel, though, is that there is peace with Christ. And so we want to, you know, emphasize that gospel and remember how precious and beautiful and exalted it is that we can have peace with God. The next one is the shield of faith. And, uh, you know, just the power of understanding that God is real, that he created the world, that um, he is ever present with us, and that we can put all of our faith in him and just, you know, solidly have that in place, that's going to save us tremendously. And it's just, it's just an incredible, the reason that faith is so important is because the world is so dark, and it's so full of of, you know, things telling us there can't be a God because of this, and there can't be a God because of that. But if we know the truth, that the, all those things are happening in our world because of us and all because of Him, that our faith is going to protect us tremendously. Helmet of salvation, that is the understanding, kind of back to what I was saying about, um, you know, the freedom of self-forgetfulness, but the salvation, and understanding our salvation protects our mind. It's, it's uh, they're constantly, and I had another, again, another person this week that was describing to me that when she would go to sleep at night, the dark thoughts and the dark, the fears and the, and the literally felt like demonic things coming at her. Um, it was a very interesting conversation, but we've got to have the helmet of salvation because our children are going to experience the insidiousness of Satan. Um, one of these times we will probably tell you a little bit more about some of the things that our children have experienced, but Satan is after your child. If they understand that they can stand in Christ, they will make a huge difference. It's going to protect their mind. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we've also talked, let's see, what we're going to, are you going to continue yeah, I'm taking okay, okay, so Isn't that great? I'm sorry. Here we are, empty nesters. And she still <laughs> calls me dad. For five years My name has changed. It <laughs> changed forever 33 years sorry. ago. <laughs> to dad. Sorry. And by the way, I just want to say, I'm not trying to lord it over her by being up higher than she is. Even you if I had the same size stool that she has, I would not be that low because that's just not the way I My eyesight's too bad for one thing. So I've got to be like this. So... I feel like this is subliminal. Just, 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 you know, there's something here. No, 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 there's no, something no, here. I don't know. I was just thinking as I'm looking yeah. down at her, she's being so thinking. She didn't use second you know, 40. Would, it, would yeah. it make you uncomfortable if y'all switched? Uh, I can't. You can't? I, can. I, don't, I mean, is it, it, can, no, can you though? If she wants it that way, I want it this way. And, uh, and I guess maybe there is something subliminal. I don't know. We'll but talk I don't about think it. So. All right. So we've talked about the armor of God. Now she's just updated really what we looked at last week. Right. And so you wear the you don the honor, armor of God, and this is where we get to today's. Well, the other was on today's notes, just to, to remind you, week six notes. Um, but there's two weapons. So you got armor. You're in a battle. You got weapons that you fight in this war. And the first one, of course, is the sword of the spirit, according to that scripture in Ephesians six, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and. Uh, heard me talk about it before, I think it's so incredibly interesting that we just assume that when he says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that he's talking about the Bible, and he is, but he's not. What I mean by that is, it's not the word logos, which is the Bible, it is the word Rama, which means, it's on your notes, it means, uh, I think it's in your notes, it should be, oh, that which has been uttered by the living voice spoken word. So it is the word of God. It's the word of God actually uttered out of our mouths. So it's not just in your mind or reading and stuff. And this is the kind of stuff, you know, when we spend a lot of time trying to talk about doctrines and to do to do the do's, do's and don'ts of a Christian and all that, this stuff has been missed completely. And this is what matters most. We are in the context of a war and as believers in Christ and as parents and as influencers on children we must understand that, that our battle is not against uh, 
uh, other flesh and blood. It's not against the people that even cause names or do whatever it is that people do. It's not against the people in the wrong political party or whatever it is that we Which think that, that our enemy is. Huh? Which one's the wrong one? Uh, that's, that, I'll keep that to myself. Okay, no, that's, uh, but that's uh, uh, I got friends that are involved. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it's not uh, it's not that it's a battle uh, against the word. So another misunderstanding because we've not made much of God, we've made much more of our man-made traditions in being right with God based on our own performance and works, which we as we just said cannot do. That's why people get angry and full of flesh and proud, proud, proud and judgmental and you know every extreme there is on that. Uh, because of that we haven't, that hasn't been emphasized and we haven't learned about our enemy. So some people assume, and you've heard me preach it many times, if you've heard me preach, some people assume that Satan is the opposite of God. God has no opposites. God has no rivals. He has no equals. Satan would be more like the opposite of Michael. He's an angel, a great angel. He would be like an archangel. And so that's why this first part, which I really didn't go into, Ephesians 6, it tells against principalities, against powers. And, you know, we're battling against, you know, basically the fallen angels, one-third went with Satan. So they're, they're, they're all kinds. They're... I don't know. We'll call them imps, and there's demons, and there's, uh, uh, you know, let's just put it in the levels that we understand. It's like government and like military. There is one that reigns over Bowling Green, and one that reigns, we see this in the scriptures, the Prince of Babylon, that Michael had to come and help the angel come to deliver the message to Daniel because the Prince of Babylon was keeping the message from getting out message that came as a result of <coughs> Daniel's prayers. So the prayer of the Word of God is very significant. So the reason I'm going into all that, and I'm not going to go into a deep theology on Satan. Study that for yourself. But it's because we're not dealing with, our enemy is not omnipotent like God. He's not omnipresent like God. He's not omniscient like God. He may read minds, I don't know. But what speaks to the authority is when the name of Jesus and the name, the word of God is spoken, these are the things that bring him down. And we got a biblical example. Jesus in the garden, I mean in temptation. When he's tempted, he comes back at Satan with it's the word. Now Satan abuses the word, because a lot of times he does that. He knows the word too. Jesus came back with the authority and the power of the word. And so that word is what will brought him down and defeated him and so it's one thing to pray and we pray I, so I pray out loud I'm, I'm, I'm my neighbors I know think I'm crazy uh, I, my favorite time to pray honestly is when she's gone and I pray through the house and my dog just sits on the top of the thing and he's like I mean he's looking like start, sometimes he trembles I'm like I hope it's because the angels start walking behind me while I'm praying but it may be something else I don't know but just my yelling and the way I pray and everything and 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 but I want to speak it. I want to speak God's words over, uh, speak the word of God. And so that's the that's significant. So it's spoken word is important because our battle is not against the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. And as we see in scriptures, angels are like military people. They are released to do this battle, to fight in this battle. You may not think that know that there's that battle going on even with your children and your family and whatever level it is. We may not be in the big battle. It's probably more of a little skirmish in the whole scheme of things. You know, I'm sure Hollywood and, and uh, Afghanistan and Washington uh, where the big battles are going on. Uh, but there's battles nonetheless that are taking place. And, uh, and that gives strength. And we have evidence of that. Daniel's one of the greatest books in the Bible. That, that brings out, that brought out Michael, whatever it took to get the answer to the prayer to Daniel. It took him 21 days, and that may explain some of the times when long delays happen in what we pray. You know, maybe there's something else, a stronghold that's mighty that has to come down, and there's much battle that has to come. So, anyway, uh, Jesus in the garden, I think it's all those. I to point out, too, that the interesting part was that he 
prayed for 21 days. If you look at that closely, that context that he's talking about, he prayed for 21 days, and the angel showed up in, at, at, in 21 days. It's Daniel 8 through 10, something it's like that. It's so if look it up. interesting. If you look at that, he's fasting and praying, and he said, I'm sorry, I was trying to get here. You know. And Michael helped me. And it's because, and, and I think a lot of big times, guns came out. I think a lot of times you feel like, if you're like me, you feel like, oh, that was Daniel, you know. But we're all Daniels if we are the children of God. You're a prayer we have warrior. the same yeah. open door to pray to our Father. Our <clears throat> what made Daniel different? That's a good point. What made Daniel different is he tasted and saw that God was good. Is he tested God? That God gives every single one of us the ability to be David and Daniel and all these other people. It wasn't like he just said, I'm playing favorites here. They chose God. They chose to taste and see. They chose to take God at his word. God honored that. And so anybody can do that. And that's why some of the mightiest warriors are children. Some of the mightiest warriors are getting their prayers answered and seeing this and understanding this. Sometimes we adult them and talk them out of what they did. Many times children that seek the Lord, they grasp this far better than we do because of the simplicity of not being <clears throat> polluted by all the things that we're polluted by and that the world's throwing at us. So, so just, just so I'm clear when you, what you were saying about with the sword of the Spirit, I've always been taught or assumed that that was talking about the Bible. But I, right or wrong, that's what I've been taught. So you're saying that it could be spoken I think it is the Bible, but he's talking here specifically of speaking the word. Speaking because the it's word. in the context of battle. Right. It is the Bible. I mean, my word is not significant, but God's word doesn't return to a void. In fact, let's, I'm going to let you guys read a couple of scriptures out loud, if you will. Somebody take Hebrews. Well, somebody take, first, let's take Isaiah 55, I think 8 and 9, if somebody will read that. And then somebody else turn to Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. Let's read that one. God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Okay. You know, I've never looked up, but that's wrong. It really doesn't matter. It's the Word of God. In like Rama too, it's just speaking it. It's not just talking about reading it or the Bible itself. It's about the word coming out of our lips. Well, I studied it a while back when I was in college at a class, and, and we had a, a guy that was from Africa, from Kenya. And of course, the spiritual warfare they see over there, I think, is a little different from what we see it's over there. It's more like here. what we see in the Bible. It's more like what you see in the Bible. He, he <laughs> would say babies. stuff, and it just make the hair on the back of your neck stand up like, he's like, yeah, I saw this happen. It's like, what? But he, he had just really hit home that, you know, the armor of God is all uh, defensive. That's all for like taking yes. abuse. And then the the only weapon that's offensive is the sword of the spirit. So I'm just trying to wrap my yes. mind around if we're wanting to fight back, you know, with the sword of the spirit, what does that look like? Because everything else allows you to take blows. That that allows you to give one back. And so I'm trying, trying to say what what does that look like? So so okay. So you I kinda talked we kinda talked about that last week, but we'll we'll remind Sorry. That's all right. You Center. But anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm, <laughs> That's fair. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was hey, a joke. Guilty. I know him very well. I'm guilty. not going to do that to anybody else. I might do it to Devin. But anyway, <laughs> uh, no, he, he'll, he's actually going to have uh, some tools with my mouth open next week, I think. So I think we're not going to do that with him either. All right. So anyway, um, the that's a great question. And I think that's, that's why this is so important. And this is the insanity of what many people may think of your preacher continuously talking about the attachments because the word of God is key in all this um, so the belt of truth as we talked about last week they had this long flowing tunic on you take the actually the Roman soldier or any soldier during that day and that's the image that they're given there if you don't have a belt 
you have nothing to put your sword on. You have nothing to connect your arm because the way it worked was that belt is where the breastplate connected to that. Everything connected to that. And it was absolutely for defense. And if you don't have a belt, you are going to get taken out because you, I mean you keep having to pull your pants up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're not going to have the, the steadiness of having uh, you know your 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 waist or the belt on. So if uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Is really where those I am's and who I am in Christ. I am free from condemnation. I am this. I'm that. Several ways that that works. But that breastplate of righteousness is to, from the Word as well, knowing who we are in Christ uh, uh, and being righteous. I mean, obviously, you've got to live, choose righteousness, and choose to walk in righteousness and to have clean and pure hearts, because the devil attacks that, you know, and that's the thing, the constant attack attacking truth by getting people to say that's your truth but you need to know and there needs to be that foundation in your life first Not my truth. in Not the children's truth, truth uh, in the children's life you teach them at whatever age you start doing it immediately but I don't know that they don't get some things even before they're talking we speak them into their you know speak them to them consistently so to get that foundation of truth in them so that uh, you know, so that when people start saying my truth, not in a smart aleck way, but in their hearts and their minds, they don't fall for it because they're like, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Because it is. But it's because they understand what truth is. And yes, there is black and there is white and there is this and there is that. You know, there are things, but most importantly, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So that belt of truth is huge. And in a society that we live in right now, people redefining truth and everything's a moving mark I mean it's it's like Marky Mark's outfit you know it's like it's falling it's coming down I mean there's no there's nothing to hold our society or our culture together we can just take that whole thing and make it look make the you know our nation our world but well, then the breastplate of righteousness he's attacking us especially in males I'll give an example be attacking us through pornography he's attacking us through lust is attacking us through all these things that would war against our righteousness and there has to be that foundation of righteousness which obviously we've got to pursue and put that armor on constantly because the moment it's not on the second we take it off I mean Satan is relentless and when I say Satan I'm talking about the, the this evil system not necessarily him personally but these his, forces his plan of attack right. yeah and all of his minions absolutely just want to take you out and that's what he wants to do with your children. That's why we're starting here. And uh, he wants to do it immediately. I mean, he wants to do it immediately. He wants to take an innocent little child, and somehow or another, get, that they have to catch an image that they have no business looking at. Maybe they weren't even actively looking at it. It just happened to be on the TV or just happened to be there. And the next thing you know, nightmares and things like that come into their life. And nobody even knows how it got there. I mean, that's how he works. And so that protection and that being, and, and you know, none of us are perfect. We're going to make mistakes and things are going to slip in there in this battle. But that's where we're relentless teaching. And I think we need to do this creatively. This is not, and I think some people, I remember, you remember, Alicia, when we started this back before, we had the first couple of classes. There were a couple, there was like a, um, I guess one of the Potter moms or something. And I was teaching this. She kind of took me on because she was saying, and I understand what she's saying. She was thinking, oh, you're talking about coming in there and hammering and being all strict and being all, you know, like that. No, not necessarily. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That we are, you know, I'm talking about the life. I'm talking about the Word of God. And that's our problem is when we're thinking, not spiritually, but we're thinking physically, what I do you know, and rules and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's what the law was. Rules don't work. Rules make you know that you're a sinner. That's the biggest con. That's yes. Satan's biggest one. That's right. Well, but it has to be. You have to know that first. Mm -hmm. You have to know it. Before you value it. the fact that you have salvation. And so you know it's, it first. It's important, but the, the, law, the Bible says that the law is for sinners. It's for, it's, it's for the lost. 
know. And that's part of the truth. Not, Obviously, at the I'm beginning, probably. you're going to have to teach, you know, when you have rules or whatever. But somewhere in there pretty early, you need to teach them about grace. And by that, I mean, this is righteousness. And early on, they can say, I can't do this. No one's righteous, not even one. And that's where then Jesus took care of all that. And they'll understand that quicker than you think. And the quicker that we can get them to understand that. And I'm not saying, talk about the brutality of the cross, you know, four or whatever. But, I, you know, even with but that, I kind of let the Spirit control that. These are some practical things. Every child's different. When a child starts asking me deep questions and they won't leave them alone, I mean, there's no rule that says what age they start doing that. I mean, the rule to me is the Spirit's speaking to me right now and I need to respond to this, you know, at whatever time that is. Sometimes it goes away and they just saw a kid get baptized or they saw this or that. Kind of like what my dad would. I'm kind of changing the subject a little bit, but the, we're going to obviously get into the depths of all that kind of stuff. Plan. But the breastplate of righteousness is to is to just to know that God's righteousness and the law. What are you looking at? Nothing. Oh. Yeah. She, okay, she's just looking up at you. <laughs> All right. The righteousness. <laughs> the law teaches us righteousness. So the law is essential. And, uh, and so the breastplate, the helmet of salvation, is extremely important because especially in a group of people where you've been taught all your life it's what you do going to church every time the doors are open which I think is where our friend was a year or so ago going to church every time the doors open all this stuff that's what makes you righteous and holy and then it doesn't take you long especially a teenager or somebody like that to see it's funny because it's sure not what my daddy is acting like at home it's not what my mom is acting like at home it's not what they're acting like together you know so the helmet of salvation is don't rely on mom and dad. It's Jesus Christ. He's the only one. He's the righteous one. He's the perfect one. He's all. And that helmet of salvation is what he says in his word that there's no condemnation in those in the cross Jesus. And the helmet of salvation is basically covering your mind and says, no, sir. In the name of Jesus, I am saved. In the name of Jesus, I belong to Jesus. I am, I am redeemed. I am delivered. I am whatever the list says, you know, that's what I am. And so those accusations come. You've got that helmet protecting your brain. So it's all defensive. And the sword is the offense. So that's right. Absolutely. And when you're in Africa, in many of the depths of Africa, and you're dealing even today with the same things they dealt with in the Bible, in the same way they dealt with them in the Bible, that warfare is very, that sword of the Word of God in the name of Jesus, in the authority of Jesus, and the power of Jesus, takes another level. They understand it. That's also probably why their churches, in spite of persecution, they're multiplying in growth while we are lucky to have a person a month or a person a year. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So hopefully that answers it. Um, all right. The second, there is another weapon. Uh, and that's praying in the Spirit. So I'm going to let Lori talk a little bit. She'll stay at the notes a little bit more. But I kind of want to go off and answer some of those questions that you have. Okay, well, I was just going to talk a little bit about the Bible because that's kind of my passion in, in my classes. That's my... Uh, yeah, I think that, that we, as people who've had a Bible sitting in our laps our whole lives, have kind of lost the luster of what we have. <laughs> and and so I think that's so important for us to re, you know, think about that over and over and over again because if you've got children, you've got friends, if you've got churches that are drifting away from the truth of the word, it's because they have forgotten who spoke it. <laughs> Think about the fact that the God that created the atom, and the God that created the human body, and the you know, I think they say 600,000 chemical reactions that it takes to be able to see. Um, you know, if you forget that He created that, and that He 
planted the trees and he, you know, set the solar system and could read some of the stuff that Isaac Newton said about the solar system. You know, it's not possible for this to have ever happened to science. It's just not possible. It would take far more than billions of years for this much organization to happen without a designer. And to know that that God breathed out into the, you know, pen men his actual thoughts where every word every single word is truth and we can stand on what it says and can believe what it says um, and I you know, always say it's, 40, it's 66 books, it's 40 authors but it's one message and the message is Jesus Christ everything culminates in Jesus Christ and um so if you, if, as a parent, okay, as, as a person who has this little creature that you love so much and you want to, you know, see them flourish in this life and also to go into the next life, you know, ready to meet Jesus um, covered by the blood, you know, then, then you need to know the Bible and you need to use the Bible and you need to, to put it to work in that, in that child's life. You know, and the thing that you, you'll find is that it will reveal, oh, I mean, God is so faithful that not only does he put the information there, but he puts you in front of it at the very time you need it. I don't know if he knows that or not. But the Word literally feeds you. It gives you all the nourishment that you need. Same thing for your children. If your children are having an issue, it will root out that problem. Um, you know, I've thought my mother is a incredible mother. She was very on it. I'll just give it, give her that. We would go out on dates. There were three of us, three girls. We'd go out on dates. We'd come home and she would be sitting there in that chair waiting on us. And we would sit down in the chair and she would lecture us for 45 minutes about what it means to, to be act like a lady and, you know, all of the, all the things. I mean, she was on it. But I really feel like that she could have saved herself a lot of time and a lot of this sleep if she, you know, she wasn't, she, would, she didn't use the word. And a lot of times, if your child lies, you can gently and lovingly take them to the Word and say, you know, God says that lying is going to kill you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your soul. And I don't want you to be damaging your soul by lying all the time. You know, you need to understand that it's it's bad because it hurts you or whatever. Um, it will expose attitudes that your children need to have taken away. It will teach them, you know, everything they need as they grow. And it takes a lot of the pressure off of you. You know, it's not just mom pointing the finger. It's, you know, it's, it's truth. It's written here in this word, and, and it takes the pressure off you to have to be the bad guy. Um, so I just I want to encourage you to, to, first of all, honor the, the word, but then speak the word to your children. Make sure that you're talking to them, you know, using the actual words of the Bible, reading straight from it, those kind of things, because it's going to make such a difference. And, but um, not like, but, but that's where it's so important because, like, I love my mom so much. <laughs> yeah. Pride going before the fall. I mean, I'm not talking about that or preaching or a Holy Spirit. Or, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes that's what we think when we think about yeah. speaking the word to kids. And, and that's how hopefully we can get some ideas of some fun ways to do that. Well, it's I, just the gentleness of Christ. I mean, it's just doing it lovingly and gentle. It's a gentle person. Okay, and then on with the praying in the Spirit um, and praying the Word. And, and I guess I'm just really interested, you know, what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase praying in the Spirit? <laughs> I mean, what do you picture? Have you ever watched somebody and you were like, okay, they're praying in the Spirit. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts on that? What, how is that different from, you know, what we would call an everyday prayer or whatever? I think we commonly associate it with somebody doing some kind of outward, kind of crazy dance or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's in all dignity, right? Yeah. Praying in the Spirit. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for right or wrong. Exactly, that's, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a common uh, thought. I feel like when you're praying in the Spirit, you're in the right lane with the Spirit. You're getting it. it. 
it's you know it yeah. runs communication for you and you don't say it right but if you're not praying your will but his be done you're praying in the spirit you're it's a lot easier to understand why things happen or don't happen or wait or when you're praying in the spirit because you're just kind of you're open to whatever God's plan is it's a little easier to accept speak it it doesn't happen I've done it a couple of times in my life and I'm like ah, it's that you know when you when you're praying about something that's really heavy and you feel like I need to work this out and tell God what I think needs to happen for this person for this situation but when I have just let it go and said God I don't know what to do about this you know you know where it's going you know what needs to happen you know what I need to do to be available to you to do what you need to do right. you don't need me to do anything you don't need me to ask you right. to fix this but when I would let things go being in line with the spirit <laughs> sorry it's it's I think, a, I think that's it's a, a nice feeling. That's so <laughs> good because so good. when you've been around somebody, they're praying in the spirit. You know, you just know because it transports. And it's not fancy necessarily. It's just there is a fervency and an urgency and a sincerity and a rawness and a truth and a sense of power. And as she was saying, a unity. With unity the with the Spirit yeah. and the Word of God, you know. I think that's why the Bible's so important because we, even the Old Testament, probably more so than the New Testament, loaded with Spirit-filled prayers. David's the king of it, probably. But just Jehoshaphat, what you said, one of my favorite prayers in the Bible, Jehoshaphat, and God brought out the most powerful, I mean, slaughtered the most powerful army in the world with a simple prayer. We don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. Maybe the best prayer a parent could ever pray. Because that's really the way it is. <laughs> Not even the time. <laughs> but our eyes are on you. Just fervently and from the heart. That's that's in the spirit. And that's what God wants. I want to help you. I want to show you. I love you. You're my child. I want to show you my glory. I want to show you my greatness. I want to show you my power. I want to show you my love. I want to show you my grace. That's why Jesus is like saying, Ask, seek, knock. I mean, who of you, though you're evil, would not give good gifts to your children? How much more would your father? You know, it's like, I'm blown away that you people are think so badly about God. Well, the reason was because they were taught by Pharisees. You ought to, you should do, you up, 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 and they themselves weren't doing it, and they were looking down their nose at everybody. You know? But I remember I, the first time that I really remember. I'm just going to be honest. I was like, and it's always, always up to adulthood. I'm preaching in California. And my elders made me join the ministerial association of all the other churches, not just the Church of Christ. And I said, well, I'll just go to the prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting an hour early. So I thought, I'll go to the prayer meeting. And you can ask her. I almost came back. My mind was blown. There wasn't anything to it. I mean, there was, but what they said was not like so eloquent. It's like, when I was in, we have to be decently in order. So whenever we get together, you squeeze the hand, the next guy prays, you do a chain prayer. They weren't doing that. They were praying sentences powerfully and just going boop, 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 machine gunning all through the place and shooting arrows. But the way they did it and the faith, you just could feel the faith. They weren't like praying there wasn't any, it was just, I don't need, to, it, it's unexplainable. And it changed spirit. my life. It absolutely it's changed spirit. my life. I'm like, that's praying in spirit. I didn't hear a single tongue. But uh, I'm not saying that wouldn't happen. But I mean, I didn't hear a single tongue. And most of them weren't even of that persuasion. But they were earnest in prayer. And it wasn't long until I went to another meeting, drove all the way to get to it, and they had a prayer meeting as well. But I don't, anyway, forget it. But I was saying the prayer meeting went forever because every guy went in order, stood up, and prayed a long prayer, basically like the Pharisees' prayer. Lord, I thank you. I am not. I mean, it's like, and I, I did. They were praying so long. I was late. I fought the traffic to get there. I was late. I looked in there, and they were praying. And they kept praying, and I had just come the day before from the other prayer group. And I'm like, I got back in the car and I left. 
I didn't even stay for the lunch. Hard pass. Because it's like so clear the difference in the self-righteousness and righteousness. And it's interesting that the self-righteousness, I would, I would compare it to Jesus' comparison of the sinner, the tax collector that looked up and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. There were a lot of sinners in that room praying earnestly. When I say sinners, people totally dependent on God for their righteousness, God for their power, God for their strength, God for their And I'm telling you, those kind of prayers, I believe, well, I've seen it, impact children as well. The realness of that, the rawness of that impacts them. That puts that belt on them, that puts that helmet on them, that puts that breastplate on them, that makes it real. I've, I've talked badly about my, not badly, but said something about my mom doing this, but the times that she impacted my life the most were when I would go in. A couple of times I caught her praying. When you catch your parents doing something that they don't, they think they're away from everybody and they think that nobody, and you catch her on her face in the bathroom praying forever sticks with me. I don't even know what she's praying to, but it was like, that's real. She believes this, you know, and that taught me. So those kind of things really is what this is really about. Your children catching you. And talk, that's what talking about it when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, I think that's what the Shema is, and it's who you are, it's your life. You're going to sin. We'll get to this when we get to that part. But you're going to sin, you're going to make mistakes. So how do you deal with those type of things? I'll just go ahead and give you a preview when we get to that. You ask your children to forgive you. You acknowledge your mistake. You acknowledge that you're not perfect. And you just taught them about the perfection of Jesus just taught them and now they respect you more than ever but when we act like everything's down here I don't know why I'm pointing at you if everything's down here everything is, is you know pointing fingers or whatever and yet at the same time they see our imperfection yet we would never confess our sin to them or our wrongness to them that's the I mean that's that may be the biggest one of the greatest ways that your children they are so forgiving. I don't know if y'all notice that or not, but when you ask them for forgiveness, it's fascinating. They're so precious, even the singers, you know, just <laughs> awesome. I'll tell this story real quick that to kind of go with that. Uh, one time when I was at this young, he did something really big and really annoying, and I cried for two days. You know, kind of, was, I was silly. And I'll say there that I learned from that situation that your children <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, years later, I just kept feeling a conviction, and I took him out in the car one day. We went for a long ride, and I told him, kind of recounted the story to him. This is how I felt when you did this, and this is why I acted this way, but it was wrong, and it was selfish, and it was about me instead of about you, and everything, and said, you know, I didn't, I didn't do what was right. I didn't kick in and mentor you in that moment, you know, and it was just amazing to watch his face it was like it was just such it was a blessing to him to hear me say i messed up and i you know and of course i think it's important to do it on the little things too but especially on things that are like okay i scarred him for life or whatever you know to, to stop and apologize and tell him anyway they're very good at you we'll have to give you a heads up that next week's notes and that will be the same as, next, as this week's uh, as we get Are deeper we into that. Time? But I think it was a good discussion. Thanks for bringing those things up. And I definitely want to see more give and take. We want to have plenty of notes, but we got to take all the time in the world to get to those notes and to get practical about what you need. So to pray in the Spirit, you know, earnest prayer, entreating prayer, persistent prayer, petitioning prayer. So that first habit is to develop your own walk with God. So I hope you understand why we're starting with us. Because we can't, they can't catch what we don't have to get from us anyway. And, and God has put us as parents and us as people that are in their lives to influence them. Um, he's put us there for that purpose. You know, he's basically said, here, I'm giving you a 
fearfully and wonderfully made this which none of us question when we hold our babies in our hands fearfully and wonderfully made this person putting them in your hands and your ultimate goal is to put them in his hands and you can do that every day so we're going to talk about reading the bible daily praying the word daily uh, praying the lord's prayer I want to. I, want, I do want. I want to emphasize this at the end every week. Try to anyway. That uh, even now you can be learning that priestly prayer if you're not doing it. Praying that over every child nightly at least, and maybe even more than that. Uh, and I think it's good to pray it while they're awake, and the blessing of them turning around and praying it over you before you know it uh, is awesome. Uh, of course, being in the Word. I think the, uh, We Pray 40 is just a great opportunity to teach your children, especially the prayer cast videos, because everybody on those prayer cast videos is praying in the Spirit, pretty much, that I've seen. And they're seeing children like them, but not like them, because they're going through what the folks in Africa were going through. They're going through persecution, difficulty, or poverty. Uh, those are good ways to do that. Um, and the Lord's Prayer... I'll talk about that more, but the Lord's Prayer, you know, is is not been fulfilled. As long as there's evil in this world, His kingdom needs to come to that place. And besides, when asked specifically, teach us to pray, Jesus said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. There's His name. Your kingdom come. His kingdom still needs to come to Bowling Green. It still needs to come to Afghanistan. It still needs to come to our home at times. You know, it still needs to come in all of its fullness. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgiveness is huge. And children need to see that model. They don't need to see us being bitter toward people in our lives. Uh, that, that puts a stronghold of bitterness in their life. Uh, and, and then he says, uh, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. There you go. Pretty much the, the model, the foundation for everything. So even in that prayer, when Jesus thought, notice he said, deliver us from, uh, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil or some translations say uh, the evil one, which is the way I like it. Deliver us from the evil. Uh, either way, deliver us from evil. And that's a great prayer to pray over our children. God, let your kingdom come. And your will be done in their lives. And uh, leave them not in temptation, but deliver them from evil. Adam uh, Tudor is just a... Uh, Adam Tudor's kind of like a child. I don't know if you've noticed that right now, but he is. The, guys, the, the big, tall guys could give his testimony the last few weeks. So, I mean, he's, I mean, I've been preaching about some of this stuff, but he's done, he's already doing stuff I've never even thought about doing, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he is, he just texted me this morning. He's like, I, I think I figured out what I'm going to do, how I'm going to go about it, and it's 40 days. I know he won't mind telling me, you know, but he said, I mean, telling you, but he said, uh, he said, you said something about the Satanists are completely the opposite. And so the time for them is at 3 a.m. That's when they worship. That's when they do all the things that they do. He says, I'm going to set my alarm for 2.55, and I'm going to start my day at 3 o'clock praying against, you know, praying the word, praying against Satan. Like, sounds awesome to me. So I wake up a lot. 258, 259. And the reason I'm telling this is, and at that time, even if I'm in the bed or wherever I am, I pray the Lord's Prayer. Just pray the Lord's Prayer right there in my bed. Even in, in my consciousness, I can say that prayer. And say it from my heart. Kind of now that I know this about, and after learning about the occult and everything, it kind of freaks me out too. I'm kind of like Adam. Oh, I don't want to wake up anywhere close to 3 o'clock, ever. But, it's a call to prayer. That's the way I look at it. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to pray that evil somewhere in this world is going on at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that God's kingdom would come there and this will be done. So we 
definitely want to pray that protection and, and uh, put that breastplate on them. Use the sword of the Spirit and pray the Spirit. And I'm going to talk about uh, going to talk about some things about reading the Bible daily, praying the Word daily. But I'm also I'm going to spend probably most of the time what I would have done in my notes, but most of the time that what we'll do next week, Lord willing, is talk about why we should pray and talk about more, getting more practical about uh, about why why that's significant, why that's important, because. All said and done, that is that protection is what is going to deliver your children. And when all else fails, I can be a prayer warrior for my children to have the right things come into their life at the right time, the right way, all that. Father, we love you so much. Thank you. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us, each and every family, each and every person represented. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, your kingdom would come into our lives, that you would protect us from uh, the evil. Lord. We thank you for Christ, our salvation, our righteousness. We thank you for the power of the blood, the power of the name, the name that's above every name, the name of which every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth in the name of Jesus. We pray that everything we do is to glory of that name and in that name. Amen. Thanks, guys.